Alright, good morning everybody. So we are into chapter 10 now, talking about hypothesis testing with two samples. So we've been looking at hypothesis tests about one sample, um, working with both means and proportions, and that's what we're going to be working with today as well, means and proportions, but this time comparing two samples to each other. So seeing um, whether or not there is a statistically significant difference between two different samples and their means or their proportions. Okay. So first off we need to distinguish between independent and dependent sampling. So a sampling method is said to be independent when the individuals selected for one sample do not dictate which individuals are to be in a second sample. Okay. So if they're completely independent of each other. Uh, whereas dependent samples um, occur when the individuals selected to be in one sample are used to determine the individuals to be in the second sample. Uh, dependent samples are often referred to as matched pair samples. Uh, and it's possible for an individual to be matched paired against him or herself. So like an example of a dependent uh, sampling method would be if one sample was comparing you know, wives and then the other sample was their corresponding husbands or something like that. Um, that would be a dependent sample because in or the participants in the second sample are being chosen because of their relationship to the participants in the first sample. Um, things like that. Okay. So what we're going to be primarily working with are the independent samples. So these are the ones, whoops, got way too high of an opacity there. So these are the ones that we are going to be working with are the independent samples. All right. So let's just look at uh, an example real quick dealing with the difference. So determine whether the given sampling method is independent or dependent. So first up, a researcher wants to know whether the price of a one-night stay at a Holiday Inn Express is less than the price of a one-night stay at a Red Roof Inn. The researcher randomly selects eight towns where the location of the hotels is close to each other and determines the price of a one-night stay. All right, so think about whether this would be independent or dependent. Okay, so in this case, um, this one is going to be dependent. So it's, it's interesting because you think maybe the hotels don't have anything to do with each other, but just think about that idea of, again, the matched pair here. So these two, uh, these are dependent. And the reason they're dependent is because the hotels you're selecting are based on the town, based on the location. So if I'm picking, uh, what are we comparing here? Holiday Inn Express with Red Roof Inn. So if I pick a town and I pick the Red Roof Inn in that town, then I have to pick the Holiday Inn Express that's near that Red Roof Inn, right? Because if I pick something really far away, then that's not as accurate of a test of what I'm looking for. Um, so we, by necessity, have to pick hotels close to each other, which means that they're going to be somewhat dependent on each other, right? There might be a relationship between those values. So we have a matched, matched pair relationship between the hotels. Okay, so that one would be a dependent sampling method. For part B, a researcher wants to know whether the state quarters introduced in 99 have a mean weight that is different from traditional quarters. The researcher randomly selects 18 state quarters and 16 traditional quarters and compares their weights. So think about whether this would be dependent or independent, and hopefully we can see that uh, there is no relationship right, between the 18 state quarters selected and the 16 traditional quarters selected. It's not like he's saying, okay, well, if I pick this traditional quarter, then I have to pick this state quarter, or vice versa. Right? There's no relationship at all between these two. So this would be considered an independent sampling method. So that's independent. All right. Uh, and then just a note down here, even though it's possible to calculate p-value by hand, we'll save some time and potential arithmetic errors by using the calculator or statistical technology. So that's just to say we're going to be using Desmos um, to compute the test statistics, um, so you don't have to worry about doing it by hand. Okay, so let's get into this first section here. So 
two population means with unknown standard deviations. So, to test hypotheses regarding two population means with unknown population standard deviations, we can use the steps from before, provided that we have large enough samples, everything is independent, and are uh, chosen randomly. Um, we make two changes to the process. So the test statistic that we're going to be using is determined by this formula. Okay, so you may this may hopefully look familiar. It's very similar to our other test statistic formula, which said that t was equal to x bar minus mu over square root of s over n. All right, that was our old formula. But now, because we're comparing two samples, we have the means from each individual sample. The first sample, the second one, and then the standard deviation and sample size for each of those as well. So we're just doing a direct comparison here. And then another important thing to notice, the degrees of freedom. So we use the smaller degrees of freedom from the two samples. So whichever sample has the smaller size, we're going to use its degrees of freedom. Um, and there is another way to compute it, and that's using this formula down here. But we're not going to use that formula, because as you can see, it's pretty, pretty ugly to use. Even typing that in in a, in a calculator is pretty rough. So um, we're just going to use whichever the lower degrees of freedom is, is the one that we're going to use. Okay. So when it comes to running these hypothesis tests, uh, not a lot is going to change but with what we've already been doing, except now we just have two samples to work with. So first, we're going to determine the null and alternative hypotheses. We're going to determine the type of test, so whether it's left-tailed, left right-tailed, two-tailed. Um, select our significance level alpha. And then we're going to, they, they suggest using the p-value approach. Um, you can use, like we did in the last chapter, the classical approach. Um, you can also use the confidence interval approach. Um, but they really like to emphasize the p-value approach. So that's the one that we're going to work with um, during this chapter. So we need to compute the p-value, compare it with alpha, and then start making conclusions. So determine whether it's bigger than alpha, in which case we reject h naught or excuse me, less than alpha, in which case we reject H0, or if it's bigger than alpha, we don't reject H0, and then make a conclusion. Okay, so we make a conclusion within context, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so then they give the calculator steps here, um, but again, on Desmos, we can go through that. All right, so let's look at this first example here. So a study is done to determine if company A retains its workers longer than company B. Company A samples 15 workers, and their average time with the company is 5 years, with a standard deviation of 1.2. Company B samples 20 workers, and their average time with the company is 4.5 years, with a standard deviation of 0.8. Assume the populations are normally distributed. Conduct an appropriate hypothesis test at the point at the excuse me 5% significance level. Okay. So first off, let's establish our hypotheses here. So we have H0 and H1, our alternative. Okay, so when it comes to comparing uh, two samples and their means in particular, the general assumption is always going to be that they are the same, that they are equal. So I'm going to use mu sub A, and that's equal to mu sub B. All right, so the general null hypothesis is always going to be that they're equal. The alternative is that somehow they're not equal. In this case, we're trying to determine if company A retains its workers longer than company B. So in other words, the, main, uh, the mean time of retention we're saying is greater in A than it is in B. All right, so let me just separate that off there. So those are our hypotheses. So, when it comes to setting up all our information here, let's go ahead and get some of the stuff we need. So we're going to need x bar for a, which we got in the problem, right? That was 15, 15 workers, 
Uh, whoops, nope, that's not what we want. 15 is the sample size. Uh, the mean time with the company is 5 years. There we go. So x bar is 5. The standard deviation of the sample, they told us, is 1.2. And the sample size, which I just mentioned, that was 15 workers that they have. And then let's do the same thing for B. So the mean is going to be 4.5 years is the average amount of time spent with B. Okay. And then their standard deviation is going to be 0.8. And then their sample size. Oops. So their sample size was 20 workers. That's right there. Okay. So those are a lot of the pieces we need. Let's see what else. Uh, we know alpha is 0.05. Right, significance level and we also know the degrees of freedom so degrees of freedom are determined by whichever sample is smaller so in our case that's the first one right that's a has a sample size of 15 so it's going to be 15 minus 1 which is 14 so our degrees of freedom is 14 on this one okay so now we can go ahead and get our test statistic. So let's do that right now. So we have T naught equals, so that's the first sample mean minus the second sample mean minus population mean at A minus population mean at B over square root of 1.2 squared over 15 plus 0 0.8 squared over 20. Okay, so that's our x, x1 bar minus x2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 all over square root s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. Okay, so that's just that formula, just plugging and chugging there. Now the nice thing about this formula is that this term over here, the null hypothesis is always telling us that these two things are equal, which means that if they're equal and I subtract one from the other, that's going to be equal to zero, and it turns out that this is always going to be the case. As long as our null hypothesis is that they're equal, that's always going to become a zero, and we don't need to know what they are. Okay? And that's one of the beauties of this method, is we don't need to know what the mean uh, values were for the populations. Okay? So if we plug and chug this, so I'll, let me go ahead and show this one on, the, on Desmos. You can also do it on a calculator. Um, but that way you know kind of how to go about it. Um, but then the future ones I'm going to leave to you. So let me pull Desmos. Okay. So uh, with Desmos, got to be careful with those parentheses. So that's 5 minus 4.5. Okay. And then over uh, square root. So we have 1.2 squared over 15 and then plus 0 0.8 squared over 20 and that gives us our value now uh, you have to make sure it's usually a good idea even if you are going to plug these into Desmos to write it out first because you want to make sure that what you have on Desmos matches what you have written down um, because if you have parentheses in the wrong place or you have some weird pluses or division in there, uh, it can mess up that answer. So you want to make sure that it, it looks correct when you're typing it in. Okay, so we get about 1.3975. Go ahead and just make those four. It looks like a nice round number. 
So we get T naught is approximately equal to 1.3975. All right, so that's our test statistic. So that's going to be important for us. Uh, what type of test is this? This is going to be right-tailed, and again, that comes from over here. So it's right-tailed because uh, we're looking at the mean for A being greater than the mean for B. Okay, so we have here, it is right-tailed. Okay, and you can look at the, the normal curve if you like, but here's our t-value 1.3975 and this area that we're going to look at here that's going to be our p-value okay and if the p-value is bigger than alpha then we do not get to reject the null hypothesis we just have to go with status quo but if the p-value is less than alpha then we do get to reject the null and we can say that our conclusion has enough evidence to support it okay so let's get the p-value so p-value that equals probability that t is greater than 1.3975. Okay. So this is going to come from Desmos. So let me pull that back up. So let me get rid of that. So for this one, we need the t distribution. So you can either just type it in directly or go to your functions, distribution, t distribution, so t dist. Enter the degrees of freedom, which we found earlier was 14. And there's our normal curve. Find the cumulative probability. And then we need the area above 1.3975 1 1 that's our minimum so you can see down here there's our area okay so anything greater than 1.3975 and we get 0 0.092 approximately It's taking a little time to get loaded up here. There we go. So we got this is approximately 0 0.092. So when we compare, so our p-value of 0 0.092, compare that to alpha, which we said was 0 0.05 is alpha. This one is actually greater than alpha. Okay, so since its value is greater than alpha, we can go ahead and make a conclusion here. So since the p-value is greater than alpha, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, and if we do not reject the null hypothesis, then what does that tell us about our conclusion for the problem in context? Right, so remember what the question was asking us for? Uh, determine if company A retains its workers longer than company B based on these two samples. Uh, it looks like we do not have sufficient evidence to support that claim. So we say there is insufficient evidence to conclude Company A retains its workers longer than Company B. Okay, so that would be our conclusion for this problem. All right, so let's go ahead and look at another one. So a researcher wanted to know whether state quarters had a weight that is more than traditional quarters 
the researcher randomly selected 18 state quarters and 16 traditional quarters, weighed each of them, and obtained the following data. Okay, so we have uh, all of our weights of our 18 state quarters, the weights of our 16 traditional quarters. Okay, and then we want to test the claim that the state quarters have a mean weight that is more than traditional quarters at the 0.01 level of significance. Okay. Um, so, and then it lets us know that uh, the population s appears normal and uh, we see that there are no outliers here. So uh, we don't have to worry about that in this sample. Okay, so let's go ahead and get our hypotheses up here. So H0 and H1. So the null hypothesis, of course, is that they're the same, right? The mean weights, mean weight of one is equal to the other. And we're trying to test the claim that the state quarters have a weight that is greater than the traditional quarters. And let's see here. So we're running the same test we did before, um, except now we're given the data instead of just given the raw numbers. So we would need to go ahead and compute the mean and standard deviation of these on our own. So we would need to do that in Desmos. So let me just show you roughly what we would do here. So you would create a set, um, you would call it whatever you like. So like for the state quarters, for example, call it S, say S equals and then you do square brackets and then you would start inputting your data so 5.70 5.73 and then you would just etc 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 you'd put the rest in there okay, and then close off your brackets and then you could just start running all of these tests on it right so you could do uh, you can do the mean right there you can do standard deviation right there And those are really the ones we need in this context, but you can do all sorts of things with it. Um, so you get those on Desmos, do it for both of the samples. And I can just tell you what that's going to give us in this case. So we're going to get X1 bar. Uh, that first sample mean is 5.702. The standard deviation we get is 0. 04965 and sample size of course there were 18 state quarters there okay, and then for the second sample we get sample mean of 5.649 standard deviation of 0 0.06 894 and sample size of 16 on that one. All right. So once we have that information, um, let's see what else do we have here? We have alpha, right? So we have alpha is 0.01. We also have the degrees of freedom is whichever one is smaller, which in this case that's the traditional quarters, have the smaller size of 16, so 16 minus 1, we're going to have 15 degrees of freedom. So we could set up our test statistic, and then we would get, so 5.702 minus 5.649 minus 0 again because the population means we're assuming to be equal over square root 0.06 
standard deviation, 49, whoops, try that again, 0 0.04965 squared over 18 plus 0 0.06894 squared over 16. which if you plug and chug that will give you approximately 2.544 okay, so that is our test statistic in this case uh, once again this is a right tailed test and again because we have that relationship over here where we're looking at something being greater than something else so we have that it is, is is right tailed. Okay, so we have our normal curve, and then there's our test statistic. So our 2.544, and then our p value we're looking for is that area greater than that test statistic. Okay, so let's get the p value. So our p value. That's probability that t is greater than 2.544, which, again, do the same thing we did on the last one. That's approximately 0 0.0112. Okay, and then compare that to our alpha value. Our alpha value was 0 0.01, so this is actually greater then 0.01, which is alpha. So, since we got that this value is greater, it's actually not a lot greater, right? But it is greater. So, since the p-value is greater than alpha, we do not reject the null hypothesis. So, we're going to have to conclude that there is insufficient evidence. Okay, but I do want to make just a brief note here. Uh, so, do this over here. So, notice. Because we're doing this at a 1% level of significance, um, the p-value was slightly greater than alpha. If we had done this at a 0.05 level of significance, we actually would have rejected. So if we had worked with 5% significance, we would have rejected the null. So if we had done 5%, we would have rejected the null, but apparently they're saying that um, being 95% confident is not enough for them. They're saying that they want to be 99% confident. So we cannot say with 99% confidence that the state quarters weigh more. Okay, So there is insufficient evidence to conclude with 99% confidence that the state quarters weigh more than the traditional. Alright, so we end up not rejecting the null 